Please be seated. So we're going to gather together today and we're going to look at a word called joy. So I will start by saying that when we look at the challenges in our life, there are times that we definitely question whether or not we are happy. And in 20th century life, that's the word that we use probably more often than joy is happiness. Are we happy? Are we happy with our situation in life? Are we happy with our friends? Are we happy with our family? Are we happy with our jobs? Are we happy with our cars, our homes, our stuff? Well, today we're going to get beyond happiness as we look at life, and we're going to look at the term joy. And we're going to look at words from James in his letter to the church talking about being joyful. And we're going to face this and intermix this with what it then means to be joyful in times of trial. We're continuing on as we look at persecution in the church and how we should be prepared to face it. We should be prepared to face it in joy. So if you'd like to follow along with me, our scripture today comes from the book of James, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And this is what is written. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith <coughs> produces perseverance. <coughs> Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, <coughs> not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who will give you generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Let us pray. Dear Father, we come before you this morning asking you to open these words to our hearts. That Father, as we study your word this morning, as we prepare it to use it in our lives, that you would fill us with your spirit to understand it and apply it. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. So we look at James today. He starts off by saying, consider it pure joy. Well, first of all, before we get to that, we need to know who is this James and what church is he writing the letter to? So to start off, James could be one of about five different James that are mentioned in the New Testament. There were two James that were uh, apostles, that were disciples of Jesus. The, the relevant thought is it's probably not it. What people have come to think is that the James mentioned in this book is probably Jesus' brother. So he would have been another son of Mary at some point in time. So he has a closeness, a tie to what it means to be a Christian in the time. The church he's writing to is the 12 tribes. The church has been dispersed out of Israel because of intense persecution. The church is scattered amongst the towns and the cities. In some cases in hiding, in some cases under assault and attack. So James takes time knowing very specifically what it means to be a Christian. Knowing very specifically what it means for a church in tribulation and trial. And he writes these words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, at first reading, you would read this and probably think, this guy is a little bit crazy. Consider it pure joy when you face trials. I don't know about you, but in my reading of this in current day times, I think of joy and happiness in the same sentence or the same meaning. And when I read this and say, consider it pure happiness when you face trials of many kinds, I think it's kind of hard to be happy in the midst of trial and turmoil. And we think that the church he's writing it to, a church that's beat up, that's beat down, that's split, that's chased, that's attacked. This wouldn't make any sense to say, consider happiness, my friends, when you've lost your house, and you've lost your family, and you've lost your stuff, and your job, and your health. So I don't think that is the meaning that James went to, and further, it is not the meaning. We need to understand what it means to have pure joy. But what is pure joy? When we look at it in its meaning, it talks about having a joy that comes from the Spirit of Jesus Christ living up in your life, going through who you are. 
much in the opposite of the term happiness, which is an emotional feeling that we get in good times. I asked our young members today, what makes you happy? And they listed the things that all of us would list. Our favorite hobbies, our favorite places to go, our favorite foods to eat, our favorite season of the year. I know that first spring morning when you can roll your windows down driving down the road, there's that smell of spring. It makes us happy. Happiness comes when we see new babies being born, or we see a child that has received an award. Or in our lives, maybe we've gotten an accomplishment that we've been working towards. Those things make us happy. But in trial, and in temptation, and in problem, and in persecution, James is saying to consider it pure joy. So we have to understand where that joy comes from. Well, I would say... First of all, say to David that joy comes from an understanding that we have eternal salvation, eternal life in Jesus Christ. If we can understand what that eternal salvation truly means, if we can understand that in that eternal life Jesus has bought and paid for us so that we don't have to suffer for all of eternity, then we can start to understand the joy that James is talking about. But this isn't the only place in Scripture that this is referenced. So, in Matthew 5, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because it is your great reward in heaven. Now, these are Jesus' words to the disciples. Rejoice and be glad, because it is your great reward in heaven that gets you through this. <laughs> so we look at pure joy again. We have to go back to the pure part, something that is untainted, <coughs> that is unaffected by anything else. Period. We look at joy, a feeling of excitement. So Jesus is telling his disciples, consider it joy, consider it happiness, consider it gladness when you're being insulted and persecuted because of me, because of Jesus, because great is your reward in heaven. And then we can look at <coughs> Peter in his letter. He says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. So we have several points in the New Testament. The word joy is mentioned in the Bible 165 times. Why? Because we should be joyful knowing that we are saved. We are free. We aren't bound by the problems and the trials of this world. But that doesn't mean that we don't go through them. And I think that's why James made a point here not to use the word be happy. Because happiness is an emotion that comes and goes. As is sadness, as is fear, as are all these other things that are emotions. So James goes beyond that and says let's get past the emotional waves and go to the core value of who we are. We should be joyful people living in the world. Does that mean you won't have bad days? No. Ask my wife. I have one from time to time. It's usually not real good when I have one. But that goes beyond, again, understanding what it means to be truly joyful in life. And we look at this in the context of persecution, of trials and tribulations, and we start to understand what it is. Peter, Peter James goes on to tell us not to fall into the traps of life. Well, a couple of those I want to look at are denial, complaints, and self-pity. How many of you fall into those? I know I have. I've been in the denial thing. Bad things happen, and my first response is, that didn't just happen. We're not going to look at that. Or maybe complaints. Maybe we go about our day talking about how bad things are in our realm and our view of life. Things aren't working out. They aren't the way we want them to be. Things aren't just good. And then the third part is self-pity. We start to look at ourselves and say, my life is so bad. Everything around me is awful. Why me? How many have been there? Well, when we look at that and we start to understand that this pure joy should eliminate those things, look at it from the denial standpoint. Something bad happens to us. <clears throat> we get a speeding ticket. We get fired. We find out from the doctor that we have an illness. We can first of all deny it or we can look at God <clears throat> and say, you've got this. 
I don't feel good, I'm not happy, but I understand in my life, you have a plan for these things. The complaining. How different would our lives all be rather than complaining about something happens or something that comes up, and instead we look and say, God, I don't know why these trials are here. I don't know what challenges I'm going through in life, but you know what? It's going to be for the better. And today I don't feel real good. Tomorrow I might not either, but in the end, I know that God has this. And self-pity, if we pick ourselves up, if we stand above and stand beyond all of the things that face us in our daily lives, people will start to see the joy in our souls. I believe that collectively we can get down on things. I look at sports as an illustration of this. Football teams that go out on the field on Sunday, the ones that believe they can beat anybody at all odds are the ones that go in and win the game. Several years ago in the Super Bowl, the New York Giants lined up against the New England Patriots. The New England Patriots were undefeated for the season, including the playoffs. Nobody picked the Giants to win the Super Bowl that year. But as a team, they picked themselves up, and they believed that life was better, and that they were better than the odds that were against them. In our life, that joy that James is talking about is the same kind of thing. We have to believe deep down in our souls and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ reigns supreme in all things. And when we can understand that, we can look at the joy of eternity that comes <laughs> in the daily circumstances. The challenges around us don't add up to be as bad. So James continues and he says that testing produces perseverance. We need to persevere through the trials of life, through the trials of temptation, through the challenges that are there. Paul talks about persevering. Peter talks about persevering. Jesus talks about persevering. We see the church all through the New and the Old Testament persevering through the challenges that are before them. And what happens? The church gets stronger through the perseverance. Trials cause us to do that. Temptations cause us to persevere through all things that are against us. And then in the end of our scripture today, James comes to us and he says that when we ask, we must believe and not doubt. Because in all things, God will give us the wisdom to move forward. I think the joy and the wisdom in these two things come together to make this scripture complete in what we read today. The first part is, James says, have joy in all things and all kinds of trials. And that's easy to say, but very hard to do if we don't understand the joy that's in us. We can look at people and say, chin up, tomorrow will be better. I've had that told to me before in my life. And I can remember at times thinking, yeah, but you're not me. And tomorrow doesn't look too good either. But when we start to have the wisdom in God, when we start to say, God, I need to understand these trials from your perspective. <laughs> I need to understand these trials from the perspective that God has given us a big life, an opportunity to share and do and give. Then we start to understand this joy. And when we go to God, James says, if we ask Him for wisdom, if we ask Him for all of these things, He will give it to us in proportion of where we are. I think the two have to go together. You see, if we don't understand God's role for us in our lives, if we don't understand God's purpose, if we don't understand God's big plan and the roadmap for it, we can get down. We can get upset. But when we start to understand that, when we start to put all those things together, and we look at God and say, I'm facing trials right now. And many of us are. When we look at Him and say, God, I'm facing trials. I need wisdom to understand. And when we believe that prayer, and when we listen to that prayer, and when we be still our souls, and we go to a quiet place and we listen, the Spirit will start to reveal for us. And when we start to understand where God is calling us, when these churches that were scattered start to look and say, God is working, then we can understand what it means to have pure joy in all circumstances, in all trials, in all tribulations. Friends, the great gift for us in faith is that God loves us and picks us up. He carries us in all things. But in the end, he says this, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like waves in the wind, blown to and fro wherever the wind chooses. Friends, all of this comes down to our core belief. 
Do we believe? Do we truly understand that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God is King, and that the Spirit lives within us? When we come to a true belief in those things, when we can get on our knees and say, God, I know you're alive, I know you're there, Jesus Christ, I need you in my life to lead and to guide and to take me, and we listen for the Spirit to work in us, then we can find this pure joy. And I've seen it on the faces of people that are in bad situations. I've talked to people that are going through tremendous trials in life. The ones that believe and understand Jesus Christ usually have a smile on their face. And they'll say something to the tune of, things are really bad, but God's a whole lot bigger. And when we have the opportunity to talk to this family in Syria as an example, I think you're going to hear that kind of a message. Things are really bad, but God's bigger. When we talk to people of faith that are going through life-changing circumstances, they will look at you and say, my life's kind of bad right now, but I have joy in Jesus Christ because He's bigger. Friends, my encouragement for us today in this portion as we look at persecution in the church, as we look at trials we go through, is that if you're facing one right now in your life, to take it by the horn, so to speak. <clears throat> to jump on its back and say, we're going to go forward because Jesus Christ is leading the way. And when we can look at life in that perspective, then I believe all of us can understand this phrase, consider pure joy when you face trials and tribulations. For they are there that we can live our faith and show God in who we are and what we do. Let's pray. Dear Father, we come to you today and pray that you'll be with us and guide us, that you will lift us up in your hands, <coughs> that you will keep us in your will wherever we may be. Father, we all face trials and tribulations. We all face the temptations. Father, the church is in persecution in places around the world. Father, today we come before you and ask that in all those things, in all those places, in all those times, you will help us to stand strong in you, that we may find pure joy and look up in your name. We pray these things in your name, Lord. Amen. If you would